Well, I'm here today to talk to Dame Margaret Turner Warwick, who has had an extremely distinguished career in respiratory medicine and is certainly one of the giants of respiratory medicine of our time. She went to Oxford University in 1943 and then did her clinical training at University College Hospital in London and then went on to specialise in chest medicine and became professor of thoracic medicine or professor of medicine uh, at the Cardiothoracic Institute, which is part of London University, in 1972. She retired from that post in 1987 and in 1989 became the first woman president of the Royal College of Physicians in its 500 year history. So Margaret's been through very challenging times in medicine and I think we're really fascinated to hear of some of her recollections through her very distinguished career. So perhaps I could start, Margaret, by asking you about how you got into medicine. Why did you choose mm. that? But at the time, it was quite difficult for women to make their way in medicine. Oh, it was long before that. The, the story is, as I remember it, uh, my father was a lawyer and uh, he had four daughters, two replacements and two spares. And I was the first spare. So, uh, and he said, there are no diaries in this family, but you can have any um, education, ad academic education you wished. So my eldest sister read botany at the university, uh, and uh, so she took science. My second sister uh, did modern languages at Oxford, and so she had taken the arts. And so at the age of eight, he turned to me and said, what are you going to do? And so I was flummoxed because I, the science was taken and arts was taken, what was left for me? And I suddenly um, hit on the idea that I'd do medicine because it was neither a science nor an art. Uh, so that was quite interesting. And the more I got used to this idea, the more uh, I liked it. And in any case, I was rather an obstinate child and I wasn't gonna change my mind, so there it was. How many female medical students were training ah, at the University College Hospital at that time? No, well, it's Oxford, I think, you probably. We had a quota of 7%. Mm. Um, how I got into Oxford was really rather peculiar because, very briefly, the education during the war was really rather chaotic. So I landed in the sixth form at St Paul's. And, of course, St Paul's was a very distinguished girls' school and they all got very good scholarships in exhibitions because they did their Oxford entrance after they'd done their A-levels, or high school certificate as it was then. Uh, and uh, my father said he wanted me to do it a year, a year before, before I took my own. And having had a, a, a very complex education before that changing about, um, I had huge gaps in my knowledge and there was a really a great row between my dad, who said that I, he wanted me to take the Oxford entrance here early, and the headmistress, who was a very good lady, who said, none of our girls do, uh, uh, do the Oxford entrance because I expect them all to get scholarships and exhibitions. Uh, so I went up, Papa had his way, and I went up and set the paper. And there were two sections, you probably remember, the commoner section and another section if you wanted a scholarship. So uh, they said only look at the commoners, of course, and I couldn't answer any of the questions. So force majeure, I had to do the scholarship ones, and they promptly gave me a scholarship. So uh, school was delighted I hadn't let them down. Papa was delighted uh, that um, you know, he'd made the right decision. And it really, the scholarship has done me quite a lot of good since. So uh, there we are. Very good. And then you went on to... That we had 7% seven, 7 women. Yes. I mean, think of a quota of mm. women these days. Yes, it's really... shocking. But, but at UCH, they yeah. were doing clinical ah, yeah. training. But it, how, it, how many it, Yeah, there were, there, there, it, was a, it was very small. Yes. Uh, but there were only four medical schools in London because the Oxford Medical School had hardly started. Mm. Um, King's, the Royal Free, 
St. Mary's and UCH. And I thought UCH was much the best. And they also had taken women for a long time, so everybody was judged on merit, not uh, anything else. And it turned out to be a very good idea. And I suppose at that time, most of the women who were, were in medicine went into general practice. Yes, that, that's right. They went into general practice or various part-time jobs as clinics in various ways, sometimes attached to hospitals. And there, there were three uh, women at uh, UCH, um, uh, uh, Monica McCallan, um, uh, uh, Peggy Morgans and Joan Stokes, who were running big departments of allergy, diabetes and microbiology. And none of them were consultants because they weren't allowed to be. Extraordinary. How did you choose respiratory medicine? Well, I couldn't because there were no jobs for women in teaching hospitals or virtually none. And so I got a job, force majeure, at the Elizabeth Eric Anderson Hospital as a general physician for about seven years. And then there was a wonderful advertisement in the paper. Um, f they wanted somebody to come to the Brompton to do uh, uh, academic chest medicine with Guy Scadding on a part-time basis, because that's all they had the money for, uh, who perhaps had got a background in um, general med medicine, so they uh, some people said it was rather a contrived appointment, but that's, that's a personal opinion. And uh, so that's what I did, and that's where I really got into uh, um, uh, chest medicine for the first time, under Guy. And at that time, there must have been a big problem with tuberculosis. Uh -huh. And this yeah. is one of the problems of chest medicine, in a way, because yeah. they were often put in isolated hospitals away well, from the academic that's right. community. That's right. Well, that, of course, was my idea when I was at UCH doing a, regis a registrar job before a consultant. Um, I thought, and I would got a husband and two small children, and I thought a chess clinic would be um, a very attractive job that I could work to part-time. Uh, unfortunately, my chiefs at the time, Howard Nicholson and Andrew Moreland thought it was a thoroughly bad idea and uh, uh, sort of steered me away from that. Uh, but it, then, of course, uh, they were right for the wrong reason. I couldn't do chest medicine because they all, uh, chest clinics, because they all closed because tuberculosis had been cured. So it's, it's interesting to see how things have mm. changed now. Mm. But you followed unusually for, for that time for a woman in medicine, an mm. academic career. Mm. W was that a problem? I mean, you, yes. you must have come across a lot of prejudice. No, I didn't. I think one was trained really at Oxford that if you're in such a minority, there's only one way to survive, and that's to ignore gender. And so, you know, one had been trained well, so I took no notice. Well, but uh, realising that, of course, there weren't some jobs that you would just fail at. Yes. And so, just going to your mm. research now, mm. because I'm interested mm. to, to hear about the yeah. early days of yeah. respiratory research. Well, one of your big interests has been asthma yeah. over the years. And yeah. What was happening in asthma research around the time you started? Well, it's very interesting because there was the Asthma Research Council, wasn't there? that really was promoting asthma research from early days, I think. Did they not start in about 1928 or something originally? Mm, I know. Had a long uh, so asthma research has gone on for a long time. And I think the fascinating thing about chest medicine is you have all these very important, very common diseases like asthma and chronic bronchitis and lung cancer. And you have these excessively rare ones that you can invent new diseases and have that whole spectrum uh, is, is, is a fascinating thing that I thoroughly enjoyed. So why I got into asthma really was because you couldn't avoid it. It was so common. How was it treated in those days when you started? Well, it, of course, was before effect, very effective selective um, 
aerosol um, bronchodilator sprays. And it was also long before um, the steroid sprays. So there were tablets, as the famous ones that you know, in a mixture of, of uh, theophylline and uh, beta agonist and a little bit of barbiturate thrown in. So, uh, uh, and there were various varieties of this and patients swore by them. They thought they were very good. But in fact, they didn't do well. Well, the question is, they didn't look at the... I mean, asthma deaths are still very uncommon. Mm. It's all very well to say all this focus that they've got these days on reducing asthma deaths. But you know the number better than I do. But I've always been impressed how actually rare it is, considering how common the condition is. But there were a lot of people, I mean, I remember mm. even in my mm. early days, who were very disabled by asthma. Yeah. I mean, they were respiratory crippled yes. in a way. Yes, I think that's right. And there's no doubt that particularly the steroid aerosol and, and the Ventolin have transformed uh, asthma. But there are still a lot of people that get very severe attacks. And one of the things that bothers me is to sort of um, measure the control of asthma about the numbers of people that are, have to go to hospital. And that always frightens me because if you've got a really bad attack, probably the best place to do is to go to hospital. And I mean, in those days, um, people were looking for treatments and you were involved yeah. in yeah. some of the very early yeah. studies of steroids, which yes. as you say have really yeah. revolutionized Yeah, well management. that was when I was a registrar at UCH. So, so what, what was done with steroids? How yeah. did they well they had tablets of course. Well, yes. they, well two things, they originally were started by um, uh, Herxheimer, what was his name? H Heinrich. Henry Herxheimer. Uh, or oh, Heinrich Herxheimer anyway. Yeah. Um, Andrew uh, 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 Herxheimer's father. Yeah, I think it was Henry. And he was, sorry, sorry Henry, uh, and, and he was running the asthma clinic with Monica Callanan and as an assistant. Mm. And one of the experimental things that he did was to give them hydro, uh, hydrocortisone by aerosol mm. and show that it was quite effective. Mm. So uh, again, that went back a long way before anybody really started trying to give them um, oral steroids. And why did they think to use steroids in asthma? What was well, the thinking? I don't think there was much thinking. I think it was a nasty disease. It seemed to be a condition, and it was uh, you know, one of those inflammatory and was conditions. was it known as an immune no. problem? Well, oh, yes, days? well, uh, yes. I, I mean, the uh, allergic asthma, pollen-induced asthma, uh, of course, it was before house dust, but pollen-induced asthma was well known. Um, so uh, uh, the, uh, the MRC were looking around for other interests, not tuberculosis, because they were done tuberculosis. And they set up this uh, uh, control trial with all the most modern trial techniques. And we were double-blinded, and so we shouldn't know what patient had asthma and which patient. I think this was one of the first double-blind trials ever conducted. I think that's right. But of course, as all the ones on steroids uh, had moon faces, and the ones on placebo didn't, it wasn't really very blind. <laughs> it was a bit of a giveaway. <laughs> <laughs> but they never thought of that. <laughs> But I thought that trial hadn't been very successful. It wasn't. It wasn't very successful. And I can't remember why. Uh, uh, and, but I suppose trial design, I think it was something to do with the trial design. Or the patient. Or inclusion. perhaps you know. I, I think it was linked to the fact people included people with COPD. Mm, I'm not sure because the whole idea was that asthma was a tax mm. and chronic asthma with you know, either chronic changes in the lung uh, or wheezing constantly 
I think they didn't really regard us asthma, but terminology was pretty loose those mm. days, so it may be that partly. Were you involved in some of the studies of inhaled steroids? Oh yes, because, you because were what they, they were what the very early 70s, yeah. and what the Brumpton did, we focused on long-term studies, and the first one of course was cremaglacate, Intel, because people had given most of the trials were well, three months or something easy to handle. And because asthma is a perennial condition, we reckoned that you needed perennial drugs to, um, to, 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 to uh, uh, um, you know, uh, um, uh, satisfactorily monitor it. Mm. Uh, so we tried the long term on Intel, uh, Cramaglacate, and then when we came to the long-term steroids, uh, it was the days when the different firms at the Brompton were very individually uh, um, consultant-led, and they didn't have much to do with each other. In fact, nothing at all. And I wanted to collect, uh, as Professor Manson, uh, as many, or perhaps I was a senior lecturer at the time, as many patients as I could. And I tried to ask all the eight physicians at the Brompton, whether they would contribute their, place, uh, their, their patients. And two of them, and I won't mention their names, said, uh, um, well, not on your Nelly or words to that effect, <laughs> because they weren't, didn't hold with things like trials and they just looked after patients. <laughs> and then everybody else joined in. And then I was attacked uh, one day in the car park, I remember it well, why are none of my patients in this uh, Brompton trial? So, you know, I said, would you like us to? And so we got them all in. And one of the sort of triumphs of my life, of totally no consequence, was that we really did set up the uh, idea that in long-term trials, you needed all the, pa all the physicians to work together. So we got as many patients as quickly in one centre, which was a good way of running mm -hmm. trials. One of your, your famous observations was to recognize the importance of nocturnal asthma yeah. and the use of peak flow charts, yeah. which yeah. of course developed yeah. a lot. How, how did you yeah. come into this area? Well, of course, it was very easy because, again, having a long interest in long-term patterns of disease and how you monitor them. Luckily, the peak flow came, uh, meter came in so patients could have them and we could monitor them day by day in hospital and, uh, and when they went out. And so it was a natural, really, that uh, the only problem was how you analyze these charts uh, at the end, which is not altogether easy. And that, of course, led to the other thing that I was quite keen on, which was the various subsets, not only nocturnal asthma, but the morning dipper, and the ones that their peak charts went all over the place, the brittle asthmatic mm -hmm. and uh, the irreversal asthmatic that now call, call COPD, I, think, I guess. Um, and so these subsets of asthma mm -hmm. and different treatments for them, I think was quite, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I found it fascinating. Well, this has now become very fashionable. Mm -hmm. It's called personalized medicine now, but, but I guess it's the same sort of it's thing it's taken started. It's taken 40 years to yes, catch on. absolutely. Now, the other area where you made major contributions mm. was in interstitial lung disease, mm. which were seen as quite rare diseases mm. at the time, but mm. now are recognized to be much more common. Mm. Could you tell us about some of your that was research interesting. in that yes, area? Yeah. Well, that started because when I was senior lecturer, uh, I was looking around who, what sort of area uh, I should work in, and as I didn't understand physiology, and most uh, academics in respiratory medicine were physiologists. Uh, immunology seemed to be a very interesting thing. And so I worked closely with Deborah Doniak and, and got into autoimmunity. And uh, because interstitial lung disease is so quite commonly associated with rheumatoid arthritis and systemic sclerosis, uh, it seemed to me reasonable to look at the whole field. And uh, uh, for autoantibodies, you know, anti-nuclear antibody and rheumatoid factor, especially. 
And so that's how I really got into that field. And then from there, uh, we did this retrospective study, a big study, um, 209 patients. I mean, it was one of the biggest at the time. And we learned a lot because Guy, a lot of them were Guy Scadding's patients. And uh, he generously you know, allowed me to uh, look at their notes and things. And we were able to compile a retrospective study uh, and showed right early on what was in the 1980s, I suppose, by that time, uh, that uh, uh, there was some, if you had a cellular type of histology, you'd do well on steroids. And if you had more fibrotic histology, uh, you wouldn't. And of course, this was reinvented uh, just before 1997 or something, uh, 20 years later, uh, and redesigned in name. Um, but of course, I think the uh, uh, general understanding now is that the cellular ones are really quite uncommon. And the whole bulk of the interstitial disease of unknown cause uh, are more fibrotic. And so uh, anti-inflammatory agents are sort of falling out of favor, except the very cellular ones. And hence the great drive for anti-fibrotic agents. Mm. Did you ever have any idea about mechanisms? Well, the problem about mechanisms was that the states and other places had got huge laboratories and huge resources. And I reckon we would never beat them at their own game. And that the British medicine, uh, on an international scale was better focusing on the clinical aspects and the clinical subsets and then adopting the uh, 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 ideas that they had developed in pathogenesis and mechanisms and then see how far it, far it applied to real clinical situations. And I think that theory paid off very well. And I think you did some very early work looking at the vasculature yeah. in these patients, <laughs> that which was I think has now fun. become quite an interesting well, area. Well, it took 50 years. Yes. <laughs> in 19... Uh, well, in 1957-58, I was senior registrar at the Brompton, and the problem was I was fascinated by finger clubbing in interstitial disease. And it so happened that we had a very nice, very good pathologist, but for various reasons I want to, won't get into, he uh, decided that he wasn't going to do any more autopsies. And so as a senior registrar in medicine without any training in pathology, I said, well, um, could I do the autopsies? And then there seemed to be a wonderful opportunity of just looking. If people had finger clubbing, and that you know, looked like a vascular change, why not see the vascular change in the lung? And that is more likely to be the systemic uh, uh, vasculature rather than the pulmonary circulation. And the first patient uh, autopsy I in injected with uh, Micropake, uh, which had the advantage that you could do x-rays and, and you, uh, with the preserved lung, um, these... Uh, um, you know, the ones that various other people were using, um, they, they had to destroy the lung and they just had the vascular models left. And the first patient that I injected, the, uh, or, or autopsy, uh, the whole bronchial circulation was hugely magnified. Some of the most beautiful pictures I've ever, just the very first patient, which of course set me on by chance set me onto the pattern of really looking at bronchial artery patterns in all lung diseases and had the opportunity because by that time I was doing all the autopsies for the Brompton. That's very interesting. But it shows that in those days things were so flexible you could um, just, you know, do it. So Lynn Reed must have been working yes, here. Yes, she a helped the me. Time. Did, did you work yes, with her? Yes, yeah. I didn't work with Lynn, but she actually helped me enormously with that first 
bronchial artery uh, patient because she was into that sort of technical thing. So it's interesting that many of the things you started are still going on. And of course now, now, research, now with, yeah. with, with angiogenesis, yeah. everybody's getting very excited. Yeah, and it's very interesting yeah. that um, lung cancer, also a lot of them have finger clubbing. And uh, so we did a certain amount on uh, lung cancer autopsies as well. Yes. So what was it like being an academic female mm. professor? Mm. I mean, presumably yeah. you were in a small minority. Yeah. Well, there were very few academics. And it was before personal chairs were invented. So there were just a very small number of academic professors. And I think there was one a few months, Sheila Sherlock and I were the only two professors of medicine in the country. But um, um, mainly people had to retire before um, uh, uh, you know, the chair was vacant. Now, of course, everybody can be a professor. And I think it's a good thing because it opens the field for a lot of clinical people to continue with research. Mm. And you must have seen a lot of changes in respiratory medicine. Yeah. I mean, I imagine mm. in those days it was seen as a rather separate specialty because yeah. of the link to TB. Absolutely. And, and, and cigarette did, smoking. And, a lot to and, and then, then of course, it, was, it really was a Cinderella subject, mm. um, right at the bottom of the pile. Mm. And the MRC, for instance, uh, when I was on the systems board at the MRC, I counted out the number of support, the percentage of support on respiratory diseases, and it was 8%. Uh, so Yes, well, it's not much better now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm absolutely. It, it's very difficult. But the point really is that any academic respiratory uh, ac ac uh, doctor uh, was a physiologist. And physiology dominated the research uh, all around the world. Uh, I remember giving a lecture, a rather naive lecture, at um, uh, San Diego uh, uh, on uh, something we were interested in with immune complexes uh, at the time, ages ago. And they just wouldn't believe that immunology could come into uh, any aspect into the lung at all. Um, so uh, it was quite difficult. So uh, that really, as professor of medicine, I f focused on planning the Brompton and the Department of Medicine should encourage people to specialize in other research areas, not uh, not physiology. I think we went too far, actually. But so there was uh, the asthma professor, um, asthma research council professor of pharmacology that you know about. There was uh, um, a sort of uh, protective immunity that uh, Peter Cole uh, developed. There was uh, cystic fibrosis uh, that Margaret Hodgson uh, developed. There was uh, a biochemist, um, Jeff Laurent, uh, but of course with respiratory bent because he was working on collagen and initial disease. So the idea actually was to encourage research in individual units on anything but physiology. Mm. Um, so just very briefly to go on mm. to your future, mm. I mean the career mm. after you left the Bronx and you were elected as the president of the Royal College of Physicians, mm. which is an extraordinarily powerful position mm. in medicine. Yeah. And what did you achieve in that role? I think the best thing that I managed was to get all the colleges, the Royal Colleges, to work together. There was a thing called the Conference of Royal Medical Colleges. It's now the Academy. And uh, uh, so many of the other colleges were just working on their own. But if the professional voice of medicine was going to be heard in political circumstances, we'd really got to work together. 
Now, whether that worked out, uh, I think it was better then, actually, probably, than it is currently. But I'm sure that that is the right way for the profession to go. And the, a question to finish up mm. that we've asked everyone mm. in this series is what advice do you have for someone yeah. starting out now in yeah. respiratory medicine? I think what respiratory medicine or research medicine? Well, I was thinking of respiratory medicine including yes, clinical yeah, and yeah. research. Well, I think really that the, uh, the ideal would be that they should... Uh, be, if they're practicing physicians, they should all have a research interest. And particularly if they're going to be working at a tertiary referral hospital or a really sort of premier hospital, then I think everybody should do a ward round so that they look at each patient and say what we've learned from them. And that tends, and, and then they have ideas on really the natural experiments of nature. So learn from the patients, listen Absol to the patients. Absolutely, and not only listen to the patients, but they hold the keys to so much if you can just spot them. And I think there are two other things. One is to make some observations before you have a hypothesis. Because the idea you can't do any research now without a hypothesis, well, if it's based on no uh, basic work, it won't get very far. So there's no harm in having some real observations, what are the real questions, and then uh, uh, establishing the hypothesis, and then go for it. And the last thing is reading the journals with all the um, computerized uh, electronic journals. I've noticed there's a terrible habit for them reading the summary, but not reading the paper. And if you don't read the paper, you don't read the methodology, and so you don't see the gaps in what somebody else has done. Well, that's wonderful advice to finish on. And mm -hmm. thank you very much indeed, Dame Margaret, for a fascinating conversation. Thank you. Mm -hmm.